I only keep one adult male in this 29-gallon tank because the males are very territorial, and two males in a small aquarium might spend so much of their time fighting that they end up spawning less frequently. The tank seen here contains one adult male, three adult females, and many fry of different ages. There are three caves in this aquarium, and the male has claimed the one in the center as his own. This is the only cave that they spawn in. Here the male allows the smallest of the three females in the aquarium to enter his cave. He turns to look but does not follow. If this female was ready to spawn, the male would have been right behind her. Here a second female enters the male's cave to see if it meets her approval. Nine days from now, both of these females will lay their eggs in this cave. I can always tell when the females are about to lay their eggs by watching for changes in the male's behavior. Normally, the male spends most of his time outside of the cave moving around the aquarium. However, just a few days before they spawn, the male begins to spend more and more time in and around the cave. Here, the male can be seen cleaning the exact area of the cave where he will direct the females to lay their eggs. This is a sure sign that one or more of the females will be ready to spawn soon. Another sign is that the receptive female will begin to spend more and more time near the male's cave. The male quickly takes notice of any females that approach the cave. The female swims away, but she doesn't go very far. So, he waits for her return. The female approaches the male again, only to be frightened away once more. Once the female enters the cave, the male attempts to hold her in place and then position her over the spot that he's chosen for the eggs. This female won't give in easily, and the male gets himself quite worked up trying to convince her to enter the cave and spawn. This game of cat and mouse continues for several days until the female is ready to lay her eggs. I've watched my bristlenose lay eggs three or four times, and they usually spawn at night. The male's methods seem a bit crude, but if you watch carefully, you'll be able to see him displaying several important behaviors that demonstrate to the female that he has the necessary skills to be a good father. When a female ripe with eggs approaches the male, he begins to flutter his pectoral and ventral fins. This is the same fin fluttering behavior that the male uses when he's fanning a group of eggs. This might be the male's way of demonstrating his skills at keeping the eggs clean and aerated. In the following scenes, be sure to look for the fin fluttering behavior. Another interesting courtship display is the rapid increase in the rate of breathing whenever a female approaches. It almost looks as if the male is hyperventilating. Watch the male's gill covers and mouth and you'll be able to see the increase in its rate of breathing whenever a female comes near. 
On several occasions, I've seen the male exhibit the same rapid breathing behavior over the eggs just after spawning. It's important to keep the male well fed before he spawns because after spawning he will rarely leave the eggs to feed. I place food just outside of the cave entrance for him and he does leave the eggs to feed near the cave but only for very brief periods of time. Here, the male is guarding the entrance to his cave. In the wild, suitable breeding sites are hard to find, so when a male does find a good location to spawn, it's often defended with great enthusiasm. As you watch the footage of the spawning, you may notice that the dorsal fins on both of the spawning females are looking a bit ragged. This damage is only evident on the females, and I believe that it was caused by my failing to provide extra caves just for them. The simple fact is that female bristlenose can be aggressive and territorial just like their male counterparts. So, it's important to provide extra hiding places for the females. The problem with the damaged fins was remedied as soon as I added more caves and the fins healed without any lasting damage. The smallest of the three females has entered the male's cave and now begins a prolonged period of pushing and shoving as the two fish jockey for position and prepare to spawn. The male can get quite forceful with the female while trying to get her in the proper position for spawning. The male is trying to position the female so that she places her eggs in the proper location. This is the only place where the eggs are ever laid. Knowing that these fish were about to spawn, I stayed awake most of the night waiting for this female to lay her eggs. She went in and out of the cave for several hours, but still no eggs. After seven hours of waiting for them to spawn, I finally gave up and went to bed at 4 a.m., only to awake three hours later at 7 a.m. that same morning to find that the smallest of the three females had finally laid her eggs while I slept. However, as luck would have it, a second larger female starts to enter the cave that same morning. Now, with just three hours of sleep, I settle down to watch and wait for the second female to lay her eggs. But first, there's a great deal of trial and error as the pair work out the details of when and where the eggs will be released. After nearly two hours of pre-spawn wrestling, the second female begins to release her eggs. Be sure to notice that the male has positioned his tail fin so that it sits right next to the female's vent where the eggs are being released. As the female releases her eggs, the male's tail fin acts like a funnel to help guide them into one location where they stick together to form a single compact cluster. Be sure to notice how the female pushes her body against the eggs. This motion helps to ensure that the eggs stick to each other while also pushing them toward the ceiling of the cave. The actual egg laying only takes a minute or two. Now that the female has finished laying the eggs, her role in the reproductive process is complete. 
Caring for the eggs in the subsequent fry will be the sole responsibility of the male, but first he needs to convince her to leave the cave. He tries multiple times to persuade her to move along, and in the beginning his approach is somewhat restrained, but as crucial minutes pass, his handling of the situation changes and he becomes increasingly forceful. The female seems reluctant to leave her eggs behind, and the male, who is eager to begin caring for them, is growing increasingly agitated by her unwillingness to move out of the way. The female is probably exhausted from spawning and just needs some time to rest. However, the male is not sympathetic to her situation and continues to try various strategies to move her out of the way so that he can care for the eggs. The eggs need to be fanned to keep them clean and oxygenated or the tiny embryos inside will begin to wither and die. The female has no instinctive drive to fan the eggs or keep them clean. The male bristlenose is about to repeat a curious behavior that we saw him performing earlier when he was initially courting the female. As you may recall, every time the female approached, the male would flutter his fins as if he were fanning the eggs. He would also begin to breathe like he was hyperventilating. If you look closely, you can see that the male is hyperventilating again, but this time it's right on top of the eggs. I'm not sure of the purpose of this behavior, but the last time we saw it, he was trying to convince the female to enter the cave and spawn. So, perhaps it says, follow me. It could also be that the male is just doing his very best to try and keep the eggs clean and aerated, even though the female is clearly in his way. This hyperventilation technique might also be very effective at keeping the eggs clean and aerated when they are laid in tight spaces where there might not be enough room to fan the eggs with his fins. Watch for the eggs to begin vibrating when the male starts to hyperventilate. Regardless of its purpose, the female has been driven out of the cave and the male can now begin caring for the eggs. Eight days from now, just as all of these eggs have hatched and the fry have left, a third female will enter the cave to spawn. With three adult females in this aquarium, this male certainly has a lot of work to do. Too many females can be very stressful for a single male and a ratio of one to two females per male is probably a better choice. On average, my bristlenose spawn every 27 days and I estimate that each female lays around 50 or 60 eggs each time they spawn. In order to encourage egg laying, it is often recommended that you do a water change using water that is a few degrees cooler than the normal tank water in order to simulate the rainy season of the Amazon. I prefer not to use this method. My approach is to feed them a little more and increase the amount of protein in their diet. If your bristlenose plecos are reluctant to breed, be sure that you are feeding them a steady diet of plant-based food. Be sure to provide them with driftwood and, as with all fish, be sure that the water is kept clean. And finally, be patient. The fish need to be in good condition and fully matured before they'll spawn, and in their first few attempts there may be failures as young fish learn how to spawn and properly care for the eggs. When I initially set up this breeding group, the first two spawns were ejected from the cave by the young and inexperienced male. On the third attempt, everything was flawless and he hasn't had any trouble since. It's important to remember that these fish can't be expected to thrive and breed while living on a diet of leftover flake food and tank algae. Yes, they'll do a great job eating brown diatoms and algae off of the glass, but those food items are quickly consumed and the plecos begin to grow hungry. 
These fish have a constant supply of food available, and the three females spawn with the male frequently. However, when he needs a rest or I have too many fry, I cut back on the food and the spawning slows right down. Two of the females in this tank seem to have synchronized their egg-laying schedules so that they typically lay eggs within 24 hours of each other. The third female then lays her eggs about a week later when most of the fry from the other females have left the cave. It's very likely that after a while a stable breeding colony of bristlenose may begin to establish a pattern or spawning rhythm that allows several females to spawn in a single cave on a fairly regular schedule. I've never seen the male allow a female to lay her eggs in the cave while he was still caring for early stage wrigglers like the one seen here. This female isn't fat enough to be ready for spawning anyway, but just the fact that she's hanging around the cave entrance usually means that she'll be ready to lay her own eggs very soon. But for now, the male keeps her at a safe distance from the newly hatched fry. Be sure to take note of how incredibly clean the bottom of the cave is. And if you know your bristlenose plecos, then you know they tend to poop a lot. This cleanliness comes as no accident because I've seen the male exiting the cave to poop on several occasions. Unfortunately, I was never able to capture it on film. But I think the spotlessly clean cave floor speaks for itself. Interestingly enough, the male does not begin pooping in the cave until the fry are around five days old, and that's just about when they're starting to leave home. There is some speculation that the fry acquire the beneficial gut bacteria needed to process plants by ingesting small bits of the parents' droppings, similar to the way many terrestrial herbivores acquire their beneficial bacteria. If this is true, then the fry might benefit from being left with the parents during their very early stages of growth. However, there's still a lot to learn about these incredible marvels of adaptation and new species of bristlenose catfish are being discovered every year. Which brings me to an important point. If you're a first-time buyer, be sure to confirm that what you're buying is, in fact, a bristlenose pleco. I say this because the common pleco that you typically find in stores grows to be about two feet in length, and you don't want to buy one of those accidentally. Thankfully, the bristlenose catfish stays much smaller than the common pleco, with a full-grown adult reaching a length of around five inches. However, there are several reports of older males reaching a length of up to eight inches. Oddly enough, no one knows exactly which species of bristlenose catfish most of us have in our aquariums, and it's even possible that the typical bristlenose that we see in stores is actually a hybrid of more than one species. Life expectancies vary widely, with most sources saying that they live for about five years, but apparently some individuals can live for ten or more years. As far as water temperatures go, they can handle temps in the low 60s and as high as the mid 80s. However, these are temperature extremes that would not be good for the fish long term, so it's best to aim for temps in the mid 70s. When it comes to pH and water hardness, these fish are very flexible and they can handle most water supplies within reason. Just keep things stable and given enough time, they'll usually adapt without any problems. It's easier to keep this fish without a substrate. However, if you choose to use one in your tank, a good option would be to use rounded river stones because prolonged contact with sharp-edged gravel can damage the pleco's mouth and undersides. In fact, the combination of a dirty substrate and jagged stones or decorations can lead to injuries, skin infections, and poor healing. If kept on sand, these plecos may use their tail to excavate their own spawning cavity beneath large objects in the aquarium. Be sure that nothing heavy can collapse as a result of their digging. 
If you're keeping the long fin variety of bristlenose, I strongly suggest that you avoid using plastic plants in the aquarium, because artificial plants have been known to damage their delicate fins. As far as aquarium sizes go, I've kept single adult males in 10 gallon tanks without any problems, but for a breeding pair, I would suggest using a 20 gallon long. A single pair could be bred in a 10 gallon aquarium, but these are large fish that produce a lot of mess and the water will need to be changed frequently. Males can be very combative, so for a tank with two adult males, I wouldn't use anything smaller than a 20 gallon long. Remember, several adult males in a small space will often spend so much of their time sparring that they will have little time left for spawning. So, when housing two males in small quarters, be sure to position their respective caves at opposite ends of the aquarium in order to reduce conflicts. When I'm not filming, I keep the cave darkened by hanging a small piece of styrofoam over the outside of the tank. The styrofoam is just big enough to cover the cave and keep the fish room lights from disturbing the male. A more attractive alternative for blocking out the room lights is to hang a small wooden picture frame on the outside of the cave. And now we've come full circle right back to the beginning where we started. Thank you for allowing me to take you on this journey into the hidden world of these amazing South American catfish. I highly recommend that you try this new approach to keeping and breeding the bristlenose pleco. Using this cave on the glass technique will allow you to observe the adults as they spawn. Then you'll be able to watch as the eggs develop and then hatch into tiny orange wrigglers. Finally, you'll be able to see the wrigglers in action as they mature, change color, and prepare to leave the cave. None of this is visible using the standard approach. For your convenience, I have provided a link in the description below to the same cave that I used in the video. And as an Amazon associate, I will earn a small commission from qualifying purchases. There is no extra cost to you for using this link and anything that you purchase through Amazon within 24 hours of clicking on the link will earn this channel a small commission. And now, a final note for my dedicated viewers. These videos are incredibly time consuming and very difficult to put together. Please help me to continue bringing you these one of a kind documentaries by supporting this channel in any way that you can. Please share this video with your friends, subscribe to this channel, and remember to use the bell icon so that you can be notified the next time I release a video. And, as always, I thank you for your support.